So in working with adults on the autism spectrum, sometimes we get into this business of attribution retraining. And that's a fancy term for basically helping individuals who have mind blindness, alexithymia, and other uh, traits of the disorder, such as executive function deficits and so on, helps these individuals to check the evidence before reacting. <clears throat> because if you are a spouse of someone on the autism spectrum, uh, you may have been in a situation where you've said something that in your mind was totally 100% neutral and harmless, but it downloaded in his mind as criticism or that you're being controlling or something along those lines. So one common effect of misinterpretation for people on the autism spectrum is the development of distrust in others. And honestly, in some cases, it's even what I would refer to as a mild form of paranoia. And this is largely due to impaired theory of mind skills in the cognitive profile of these individuals on the autism spectrum. Now, a theory of mind is the ability that we all have in order to make sense of the world we live in. Every person's thoughts, knowledge, beliefs, desires, and so on, make up his or her own unique theory of mind. Now, people on the autism spectrum have difficulty conceptualizing and appreciating the thoughts and feelings of others. And this is called mind blindness. And it's this mind blindness thing that makes it difficult for these individuals to be able to relate to and understand the behaviors of you, the NT spouse, and others as well, coworkers, other family members, and so on. By failing to account for others' perspectives, individuals on the autism spectrum tend to misinterpret their messages. And for the NT spouses listening to this video, you've lived it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Mind blindness also means that the individual with ASD level one has difficulty in distinguishing whether someone's actions are intentional or accidental, okay? So neurotypical people will know from the context, body language, facial cues, uh, and character of the other person involved that the intent was not to cause distress, injury, criticism, but people on the autism spectrum often focus primarily on the act and the consequences. For example, uh, he bumped into me and it hurt and so it was intentional. Whereas neurotypical people would consider the circumstances. For example, he was running, he tripped, he accidentally fell into me. So the, the neurotypical is able to fill in the blank with something that makes a little more sense than uh, conclusion jumping. With individuals on the high end of autism, there may need to be training in this business of checking the evidence before overreacting to the event or the person in question. And this training is called attribution training. The mind blind individual often blames others exclusively and tends not to consider his own contribution, or he can excessively blame himself for the events. So he, it could be attributed on either extreme. Now, one aspect of ASD is a tendency for some of these individuals to adopt an attitude of arrogance where the perceived Focus of control is always external. So when the ASD individual believes that he was a victim of some form of injustice, the perpetrator, in this case would be the NT spouse, may be held responsible and become the target for punishment or chastisement or a long lecture or be on the receiving end of a shutdown or meltdown. So people on the autism spectrum have considerable difficulty accepting that they themselves have contributed to an event. But again, the opposite can occur where he has extremely low self-esteem and feels personally responsible for too many things, which results in feelings of anxiety and guilt. So in other words, he's either taking on too much responsibility for the issue, or he's deflecting and, and not taking any responsibility for the issue in question. So 
Attribution training involves establishing the reality of the situation, the various participants' contributions to an incident, and determining how the individual on the autism spectrum can change his or her perception and response. A part of social skills training for this individual will revolve around how he attributes his success and will likely require some attribution retraining to take place. So this is where the therapist, for example, retrains the individual to think about his success as something he actively influences, not something of which he is a victim. Now there are four main factors to which we can attribute success or failure, and those are effort, ability, luck, and task difficulty. So we'll look at each of these in turn. Uh, a person attributing effort may say something along the lines of, um, I worked hard and that's why I did so good, or I was lazy and that's why I didn't accomplish my goal. So here I am attributing effort to the outcome. A person attributing ability may say something along the lines of, uh, uh, I'm so stupid, that's why I failed, or I'm so intelligent and that's why I succeeded. So here I would be attributing uh, the outcome to my ability. A person attributing luck may say something along the lines of, uh, I was wearing my lucky shirt today, and so that's why I won the game, or I wasn't wearing my lucky shirt today, and that's why I lost the game. So here I'm attributing luck to the outcome. And lastly, there's task difficulty. So if I'm attributing task difficulty, I might say something along the lines of, um, uh, the, the test was so easy, that's why I passed, or the test was really super hard, and that's why I failed. So there, I'm attributing task difficulty to the outcome. You know, people don't have any control over luck or task difficulty, and ability is gained through gaining knowledge and skills. So therefore, the only aspect that people can directly influence on a regular basis is their effort. And this is where attribution training takes place. So the individual on the autism spectrum who adopts an effort-based belief, gains an internal locus of control, which means he believes he is in control of circumstances, and he subsequently feels empowered. Now this is where the individual comes to believe that he has enough ability that with effort he can be successful, and that is uh, attribution training. Hey guys, this is Mark Hutton with AdultAspergersChat.com and today I wanted to address this business of uh, when he, in this case he, is going to be the spouse with autism spectrum disorder, when he drifts away. And what I mean by that is a lot of times she, the NT wife, will email me or uh, post a comment in some of my Facebook pages and she will say, well, you know, we were working on things, making a deliberate effort to do so and things went well for, you know, a couple weeks and then uh, he stopped doing it. Uh, it being, uh, you know, there was actually some conversation, give and take conversation, some emotional reciprocity. He was actually showing some affection and some empathy and providing some, uh, you know, moral support and so forth. Making a good faith effort. He really tried. He wants to make her happy and he was doing well for a while. And then he starts drifting away. And what I mean by that is, um, some of his connectedness starts to wane. And then she, the NT wife, views that as, oh, we're right back to square one again. This was just a temporary thing. It was just a phase. It wasn't genuine. And we're right back to this business of me feeling like I'm not important anymore. But you know what? Because of the mind blindness and the alexithymia business, and if you have any questions about that, I've got a ton of videos on those two things. He doesn't know he's drifting away. He's not purposely having the thought, oh, this emotional reciprocity is killing me. I've got to go back to my special interest because she's annoying and I just don't want to spend that much time with her. He doesn't have those kinds of thoughts. He doesn't know that the connection is starting to uh, uh, deteriorate. He's out of touch with his emotions. He's out of touch with your emotions. 
He's not reading your body language, your, your uh, facial cues. He's not picking up on your comments if you're suggesting that uh, he's slipping. He's going to have to take a direct cue from you, the NT wife, that we're starting to revert back to our old poor relatedness skills. And so you could come up with a phrase or a keyword. Uh, like you, just, you could just say something tactfully like, honey, I think we're slipping. And you can let him know ahead of time what that means. What that means is we were doing well for a while. We were actually having some give and take in conversation. You're actually showing me some empathy, some affection. I could tell that you were trying. And now it seems as though you have stopped trying. That's his cue when you... When you say we're slipping, he knows what that means. And, and he, in most cases, I have found that he will go, oh, okay, well, thanks for telling me because I didn't know. I wasn't purposely trying to re-disconnect. I thought we were still connected. So if you find that he is doing well for a time and you actually feel like you're getting somewhere and making some progress, but then it starts to revert back, you're gonna to have to let him know. He's not doing it intentionally. He doesn't know uh, the subtleties of uh, your feelings. He can't read your feelings, he can't read your mind. You're gonna to have to let him know in very concrete terms, hey, we're slipping, we were doing well. I wanna go back to how we were going and getting along two weeks ago, remember that? Two weeks ago, when things were going pretty good, I'm going to go back to that again. And he will, in most cases, go, okay, yeah, I, thanks for telling me. Okay? So the moral to this story is, when you're doing well for a time and things start to slip, let him know. We're slipping. Can we go back to, you know, we were doing pretty good a couple weeks ago. Can we go back to that? That would be a big help to him. Thanks, guys. She is high in social emotional intelligence. You, not so much. You're high in logic. So she is high in social and emotional needs. You, not so much. I mean, there's nothing wrong with this. <clears throat> she's just doing the way she's wired. You're doing the way you You don't require a whole lot of uh, talk or discussion or exploration about feelings. You're probably not a super social person unless it's work-related. So we, we have this dilemma because you can imagine, because you, you are more task-oriented, more uh, involved with uh, facts, figures, objects, task completion, where she is more of a people person. So you can see why we have this problem. That doesn't mean anybody did anything wrong. But it does cause a problem in the relationship. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. So uh, one of the main things that we're trying to accomplish is to, in my, in my book, is to reduce your relationship stress. You, the guys, I wanna reduce your relationship stress. How can I do that? Open up the channels of communication because if she were here, she would say the number one problem is he doesn't provide emotional reciprocity and we can't talk about things, especially the difficult stuff. He has a meltdown or a shutdown or some variation thereof and we can never uh, pro solve the problems. And so the problems pile up, pile up, pile up. They're in the closet this whole time and they're not going anywhere. They're still in there uh, breathing and growing. They, in other words, they get worse as time goes on. So if you have something that's three years old and then she brings it up again, it's gonna be a lot worse than if you'd have dealt with it three years ago. Her main complaint might also be he doesn't listen. So sometimes he, and I'm just speaking in generalities here, he is listening or he's pretending like he's listening, but he's not fully hearing everything. And we use the uh, percentage of maybe you only heard 80% of the 80% he heard, maybe didn't quite understand all of that, and was afraid to ask for clarification for fear he'd get his head bit off. So now he's down to 70% of comprehension. And then of the 70% that he understood, he only retained 50% of it. This could be because she provided too much data. You had brain overload and maybe were anxious as she was throwing words at you. And so you didn't retain some of these things. And then of the portion that you did retain, for whatever reason, maybe you didn't implement because maybe you just weren't quite sure what you were supposed to do or supposed to say. Most often, 
your version of meltdown or shutdown is a result of heightened anxiety. She can and has been abrasive in her approach. She had a good message, but her delivery, it wasn't tailored to a neurodiverse communication style. If she doesn't get this piece, that she's going to have to keep it short and simple and concrete and non-accusatory, then she's going to have to just continue to do it her way, which you then will continue to have anxiety over her message delivery, and the whole thing will just short circuit. So I often hear from neurotypical wives, and they say something along the lines of, well, I don't understand why he can't meet my emotional needs. It's not that difficult. I mean, he works. He's a good worker. He's a good dad for the most part. I mean, he walks normal. He talks normal. He looks normal. I just don't understand. He is not normal, okay? He is not normal. Now, I'm not saying he's defective or flawed or that there's something wrong with him or something bad about him, but he is not typical. He is wired differently. You can think of autism spectrum disorder as a disorder of social skills and a disorder of emotional intelligence. In other words, he's not going to be really professional at knowing how he feels or how other people feel. So simply think of autism spectrum disorder as someone who has some social skills issues and kind of out of touch with emotions. And that's not normal, but he's probably smarter than me. In fact, on average, people on the high functioning end of autism tend to be smarter than normal people. So there's as many ups as there are downs that come with this disorder. And then when I say that to the NTs, they go, well, okay, I understand that, but I didn't sign up for this. This is not the marriage that I had expected. Okay, I'll give you that, but guess what? He didn't sign up for it either. He didn't ask to have autism. It was given to him without his permission. And he's the one that has to live with it, more so than you. So this business of not being normal, honestly, that could be looked at as a criticism, but on the other hand, it could be looked at as a compliment because in some ways he's above normal. And honestly, I wish some of you NTs could see that. Today, I wanna to talk to the NT spouses out there, especially the NT wives. And I know that your husband on the autism spectrum is not providing you with the emotional reciprocity to the degree that you want. But bear in mind, he has a developmental disorder. That means developmentally, his social and emotional brain is somewhat stunted relative to his logical brain. So that area is immature, we will say. And I have a lot of NT wives that say, yeah, maturity level, he's probably more like a 14 year old. And I don't mean that in some kind of sarcastic way. He is low in social and emotional intelligence, which means he's low in social and emotional needs. He doesn't have a, a lot of desire to be social and outgoing and to engage in a bunch of chit chat and hang out with people. And he's not really in touch with his feelings or other people's feelings. So he may even view emotions as getting in the way of completing tasks. So he is just not in this ballpark of needing a lot of social and emotional attention. You, on the other hand, are no doubt high in social intelligence, high in emotional intelligence. And quite honestly, as much as I hate to say this because it sounds so negative at some level, he's down here and he is never, ever going to match you. Now, I'm not saying he's off the chart. He's still in the ballpark, and he can still provide some uh, emotional reciprocity. And I have support groups and therapy groups that can help him work on that. But as much as it pains me to say this, don't ever expect him to come up to your level of social and emotional intelligence, and therefore providing you with the degree of emotional reciprocity that you want. Um, I've run into this myself. Um, in fact, my mother told me several times as a child that she thought my dad preferred to be at work more than he preferred to be at home. So I know this is a painful uh, realization that so he's never ever going to provide me with the intimacy, the empathy and stuff that I want. Most likely not. That's not to say he can't come up a little bit. And that's not to say that maybe you can reduce your expectations a little bit. And I know that's a difficult thing to hear, too. And some of you NT wives are saying right now, hell, I've already done that. I've already lowered my expectations a long time ago. But the moral to this story is you cannot fix his deficits. It's a hardwired deal that's unfixable. 
um, and you wasted a lot of time and energy trying to fix the deficit. And it was not only a waste of time and energy, it made a bad problem worse because it downloaded in his mind as you were being critical, you were being over-controlling, and it raised his anxiety, which made him even less inclined to want to engage with you. Okay, so we can't fix the deficit there. But the good news is he has a lot more strengths than he does deficits. And so the moral to this video here is you and he both need to find his areas of strength. I'm sure you already know many of them. I'm sure he does. And you want to capitalize on those strengths. You want to focus on that. Spend your time and energy, both of you, on his strengths. Capitalize on those. Don't waste another second wasting time on fixing the deficit. That just ends in a disaster, as you know. So what are some of his strengths? That's not a rhetorical question. I'm asking you what are some of his strengths. In the comment section below, I want to hear from the NTs. And I want you to begin thinking about what are some of the strengths that he already has that we can build on and use those to enhance the relationship, establish communication, help him to more closely approximate you on the social and emotional scale. Okay. And I often get emails from the NT wives and she will say, uh, <clears throat> well, uh, when I suggest that he might have Asperger's syndrome, uh, he feels like he's being criticized and that it's uh, cruel that I even mentioned that. And so I've got a message for the, the guys out there who haven't been diagnosed and are afraid to go get diagnosed. Let me ask you this, what do you have to lose? If you don't have the disorder, quote unquote, you can go get an assessment and prove to her that you don't have it. That's a win for you. If you do have the disorder, you have it whether you go get a diagnosis or not. So you, you think that if you don't have it and then you go to the diagnostician and he does an assessment and says that, oh, well, you have it, that there in that moment you have it when you didn't have it before you walked in the door. If you go get an assessment and he says, yes, you pass enough of the criterion to uh, get the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder level one, you've had it ever since you were born. So my question is, what do you have to lose to go get an assessment? A little bit of money, a little bit of time. You either don't have it and then you can prove to her now, you accuse me of having high-functioning autism, Asperger's syndrome, autism, whatever we're calling it. And the diagnostician said, I don't have it. So maybe you can just stop talking about it now. But if you go and get the assessment and they say, yeah, you have it, you already had it. That's nothing new. So are you afraid to find out that you have it? That's what's really going on, isn't it? You're afraid to find out that you have it. It's kind of like uh, people who uh, think that they might have some cancer somewhere, but they're afraid to go get a test for because they don't they don't want to be told that they have cancer. It's kind of ridiculous, isn't it? By the way, uh, if you do if you do go get an assessment and they say, yeah, you have ASD level one. Did you know that there's no, shouldn't be any shame in that? If you got diagnosed with diabetes, you wouldn't all of a sudden feel ashamed or uh, feel like you gotta hide it. And by the way, there's a lot of strengths that come with autism spectrum disorder level one. Way more strengths than weaknesses. And some of those strengths, the neurotypical or the quote normal person doesn't have it. Uh, for example, uh, on average, the person on the autism spectrum is more uh, is more intelligent than the average bear. The person on the autism spectrum is very good at systematizing, at logic. I mean, and the list goes on and on and on. 
And a lot of these traits, these positive traits, the typical person doesn't have them. You know? You're on the computer a lot. Well, the guy that created the, the damn thing had Asperger's Syndrome. And I'm sure you can Google and probably already have all of the famous people with, uh, they would have called it Asperger's Syndrome uh, prior to, I don't know, about, I think about eight years ago now, they've, they changed the Diagnostic Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders when we, when they went to edition number five, it went from Asperger syndrome to, uh, they just kind of lumped it in with the autism spectrum. But at any rate, um, there's uh, many people, actors, musicians, computer scientists, engineers, the list goes on and on and on and on. People with autism spectrum disorder. There's nothing to be ashamed about if you uh, get, if you get the diagnosis. Uh, there's no reason to fear it. It's not a disease. It's not a death sentence. It's simply a different way of thinking. Uh, most specifically, it's a way of thinking that uh, has more to do with task completion and logic and not so much uh, dealing with, uh, you know, social stuff and emotions and whatnot. So, um, I don't know. I hate to talk down to you or make you think that I'm being critical, but maybe just put your big boy pants on and go get the damn assessment. So now we want to look at why people on the autism spectrum tend to prefer their special activity to spend time and energy with that as opposed to spending time and energy with their special person, uh, which in this case would be their neurotypical spouse. So if I have autism spectrum disorder, by default, I have this thing called mind blindness. Simply put, it's hard for me to predict what might be in the mind of other individuals, what they might be thinking. And that creates a cascade of problems because now, if I don't understand how they think, I also don't understand uh, why they say and do the things they do. I don't understand their motives. I don't understand their perspectives. And so I'm lost in that regard. Also with ASD, if I am wired that way, I have alexithymia, which means that I have, in addition to mind blindness, I have emotions blindness. I don't understand how I feel. I don't understand how other people feel. Uh, I don't get the connection between their facial cues, body language, and how they're feeling. I don't get the connection between their tone, tone of voice, volume of voice, uh, word each, and how that connects to their feelings. So there again, I'm lost. So being so out of touch with others in the social and emotional sense creates a lot of unpredictability in my life. I don't understand how I feel. I don't understand how you feel. I don't understand how you think, why you behave the way you do, why you say, say the things you do. I'm so out of the loop that I live 24 seven, 365 days a year in some state of unpredictability. And this chronic low grade unpredictability that manifests at home in the workplace and otherwise creates mild low-grade anxiety in me 24 7 365 days a year so living a life of chronic low-grade anxiety puts me in a position to want to reduce that anxiety so i come up with a host of anxiety reduction strategies that's going to be some version of a meltdown mild to severe and or some version of a shutdown mild to severe or I may engage in false agreement. In other words, I just give you the indication that I'm going along with what you want and what you're saying, just basically to get you to stop talking to me and end the conversation because it's getting too stressful. But one of the most important things that I do with this chronic low-grade anxiety due to so much unpredictability in my life is I create a lot of structure and routine since things are so unpredictable I try to make them as predictable as I can and that is through 
providing myself with a set of routines, a set of rules, a certain structure that I must abide by to keep my anxiety at bay. And one of the best ways that I can achieve this business of routine and structure is to find an activity that I enjoy and become totally hyper-focused and engrossed in that activity. Because now I have super predictability and I have super anxiety reduction when I am totally absorbed and mesmerized by and in my special interest. Whether that's my work or some hobby or some computer uh, game, you name it. There's a multitude of different things there. So this creates a problem for me socially because now the people that um, supposedly want to connect with me have a great difficulty connecting with me because I'm gone. I'm spending more time and energy and more passion with my special interest than with my special person or my special people. And they feel left out, ignored, disrespected. They view me as being selfish, uncaring, insensitive, narcissistic, and even sociopathic. And they feel emotionally deprived. She may even claim that she has Cassandra syndrome. All of this is not what I want and it raises my anxiety even more, which makes me engage in my special activity even more, which creates more distance between me and my special person or my special people and which makes me in turn want to spend more time with my special activity. So in summary, my spending a lot of quality time with my object of preference, which is probably nothing to do with anything social, is my structure, my routine, my anxiety reduction strategy. So I have a chronic special interest to deal with my chronic anxiety. So if I have ASD, I'm going to have a lot of routine and structure, which means I'm going to have a lot of rules. I'm going to be the type of person that wants things to be done in a certain way at a certain time. I don't want my routine interrupted. I don't want to have to shift my focus from what I'm doing now to tending to somebody else's needs or wants or desires. So I'm going to be very rule oriented. I'm going to be super resistant to any kind of change especially unexpected change. And when my routine gets interrupted, that's when my anxiety comes up and that's when the significant people in my life are probably going to witness me doing some version of a meltdown or a shutdown. So in this way, a meltdown or a shutdown or a combination thereof is really nothing more than anxiety overload, which in turn means I'm going to soon go back to reducing that anxiety, which means I'm back to my special interest again. So in a nutshell, my special activity is always highly predictable, whereas my special person is most often highly unpredictable. So now we want to look at why an individual isolated problem that could occur later this afternoon may feel so much worse than it actually is. So when there is a relationship problem, we'll just say there's an argument over something that's important to one or perhaps both parties, and there is a heated exchange, hurtful things are said and done, and it's uh, in some cases just a brutal blowout. In retrospect, when you look back on that argument or that event, there's two memories. There's the content memory and the emotional memory. The content memory is what was said, and the emotional memory is how you felt during that argument. So when you're reflecting on that argument, maybe a week later or even a month later, you have content memory and emotional memory. So every time you remember that fight, we will say, this verbal fight, you also feel the same negative emotions that you felt during that episode. And if you revisit the memory of that argument two, three, four, twelve times, each time you're going to feel just as bad as you did in the moment. And so even though the event only happened once, 
it feels as though it's happened 12 times because you replayed that video in your head of the event and each time you play it, each time you remember it, you feel it. And the other reason that a current isolated problem can feel so much worse than it actually is, is due to this cumulative effect of unresolved problems. If you're like most couples that I work with, you stop talking about problems because your conflict resolution skills as a couple sucked. Not only did you not get the problem solved, you just irritated and frustrated one another even worse than you were before you came into the discussion. So there's this pile of problems that just goes in the closet and that pile is getting really tall. And so then a, a problem comes up that let's say is a level three on a scale of one to 10, 10 being very severe. So relative to some of the other problems, a level three problem is not a big deal. But when you throw it on top of an existing pile of problems, now you have the straw that can break the camel's back. So this is why it's imperative to come up with a communication strategy that you can use that doesn't end in a disaster because you're going to remember the disaster. And each time you recall it, it's going to make it feel worse. And each time you have a problem that goes unresolved, if you guys don't talk about a problem, you don't forget about the problem. It just goes in the in the filing cabinet called unresolved problems. And when that list gets too long, both parties lose their confidence in their ability to problem solve, which even furthers the likelihood that they won't even attempt it. And now we're in trouble because you have a couple, both of which feel like they're always walking on thin ice. So in summary, the reason that a rather mild problem could feel like a super bad problem is due to the emotional memory factor and the cumulative effect of unresolved problems factor. And I have a message to the NT spouses out there today. It's not uncommon for me to get uh, concerns from NT wives when they say, you know, I try to talk to my husband about difficult things in the relationship and uh, there's things that uh, are not going right and I would really like to work on them and try to fix them, but we never broach the topic because he just has some version of a meltdown or a shutdown or he hurries up and agrees with me just to get me to shut up and he, he never follows through with anything. So. If you find that when you try to bring up important issues with him and you can never get anywhere, never get anything resolved because he either engages in some version of a shutdown or a meltdown, oftentimes, at least what I find oftentimes happens, <clears throat> is uh, has to do with tone of voice or inflection. Uh, when you're upset, even though you may not necessarily know you're upset, uh, you may think you're calm but the attitude that you bring into the conversation uh, changes your tone of voice just slightly. So what I find most often is that the NT's tone of voice changes even though, <clears throat> even though she might be trying to remain calm when approaching her husband about a difficult topic. But you know what, unless you're a very, very good actor, your attitude will kind of leak out in your tone. In other words, the inflection will seem to be a bit off to him. So a major source of sensory overload for the person with ASD is voice, especially tone of voice. He often analyzes voice tone first and then decodes the words used by you later. So any voice inflection by you that remotely conveys a negative attitude, for example, sarcasm, irritation, criticism, and so on, is going to be detected and taken personally. So a negative tone can be offensive to your ASD husband, especially if he has low self-esteem um, and is hypersensitive to criticism anyway. Um, but he's really going to be offended if he's not sure why you are using a particular inflection. He's going to be thinking, is she upset with me? Did I do something wrong? Why does she sound mad? And so then there's this loop effect that occurs in his thinking process. In other words, he mulls over the comment made by you long after the conversation has ended. You may have noticed that if he downloaded your comments as criticism um, and did some version of a meltdown, sometimes he may not talk to you again for days. I've had reports where she has said something that offended him and he, he 
gave her the silent treatment for a week. So anxiety and agitation will increase as he tries to analyze the motives of, of the speaker, in this case you. So what we're really referring to here is your spouse's obsessive way of thinking. In fact, it might be said that one of the most troublesome traits of ASD is the tendency towards repetitive thoughts, and we call those ruminations. So while the ability to have extreme focus, which your ASD husband probably can do very well, while that can be a strong point, it's a problem when he can't shift away from thinking about things that are not of his choosing. So often the person on the spectrum gets caught up in worries. He dwells on past slights from his NT spouse. He ponders his own mistakes and simply has problems letting go of past hurts. And even though the incident in question, maybe you tried to broach a difficult topic with him and it ended badly, that was just one incident. But every time he recalls that incident, which was ruminations again, even though the incident happened once, it feels to him as if it's happened 10, 12, 15, 25 times. So I hope that answers the question of why it's difficult to broach um, hard topics with him, because he may even download neutral comments from you as criticism. So the moral to the story here is we have to come up with a communication strategy that takes into account um, his uh, tendency to pay more attention to your tone of voice, especially if there's some slight annoyance or anger in there. We need to come up with a method where you're, uh, paying, it, you're paying attention to your tone of voice so that he doesn't pick up on that and hyper-focus on that. Does your neurotypical partner suspect that you have an autism spectrum disorder? And do you feel that she blames you for most of the relationship problems due to this disorder? Well, if that is the case, then here is kind of an informal quiz to see if you might want to pursue a formal diagnosis. If you answer yes to most of these questions, then your spouse may be right. So here we go. You either have the following traits or you have been accused of having them. Ready? Conflict resolution seems impossible. According to her, I am very insensitive, uncaring, and selfish. Anxiety is a common state for me to be in. Being in this relationship seems very difficult and complicated. Even if we are physically together, there is an emotional distance that leaves my wife feeling alone. Even though I like having a companion, it does create stress for me. Her expectations keep changing. Her feelings are all over the map and change from minute to minute. I am easily stressed by some social situations. I am mostly interested in my special activity rather than spending quality time with my wife. I can be self-absorbed. I can get defensive easily. I demonstrate my feelings of love through my actions rather than words or physical affection. I don't exactly know what she expects of me. I don't fully understand the nature of give and take in conversations. I don't like making commitments to other people. I don't like pressure or expectations put on me. I feel anxious when unpredictable situations occur or when things change. I find it difficult to empathize. I find it impossible to sense what my wife is feeling. I have difficulty talking about my emotions. I have had a hard time holding on to a job. I have trouble making the connection between what she is feeling and what I have done or not done to hurt her. I like talking about my special interests a lot. I need long periods of solitude and quiet time. I need structure and routine. I often cut her off and change the subject when she is in mid-sentence. 
I often deny there is a problem with our relationship. I often fail to follow through with what I have agreed to do. I often worry that I'm not capable of being a good husband. I did put some effort into winning her in the early going of the relationship, but now I don't put much effort in keeping her. I sometimes suffer from sensory overload. I tend to stay in my rational mind most of the time. I usually don't like to socialize. I usually have trouble talking with my wife about emotional issues. I'm more comfortable with old friends than new ones. I've had significant relationship problems long before I met my wife. Making compromises is difficult for me. My best efforts in the relationship still don't please her. My wife believes that she has made more adjustments to me over the years than I have to her. My wife claims she is depressed and emotionally damaged due to our relationship. My wife complains that she feels like she has to mother me. Our relationship was passionate in the beginning, but the passion has dwindled over the years down to virtually nothing. Our sex life has stalled. She always tries to change me. She claims that I'm lazy and don't contribute enough, for example, with chores. She has said I am narcissistic. She is a very complicated and difficult person. She's usually disappointed whenever her birthday or anniversary occurs. She is very needy and clingy. She often says she's not important to me. Sometimes even neutral conversations with my wife can seem like an attack or criticism. This relationship is often messy. When she wants to talk about our problems, I immediately get worried that it's going to turn into another fight. And when we argue, I tend to view my wife as very illogical, overly emotional, and even neurotic. So if you answered yes to most of those, then you don't necessarily know if you have the disorder, but you certainly know you have enough of the traits to cause relationship difficulties. Hey guys, this is Mark. Click on the join button underneath any of my videos, then click on members only videos, and then click on join. And for $9.99 a month, you'll have access to members only videos, which are excerpts from previous workshops I've conducted for NT partners, ASD partners, and the neurodiverse couple. New videos will be uploaded weekly.